I recently caught up with Dr. Michelle Greve at Aarhus University in Denmark, who has a paper out in Early View in the Journal of Ecology on explaining continental scale browser diversity across Africa. Can you um, briefly introduce yourself? Yes, um, I'm Michelle Greve. I'm a, um, I'm a researcher at Aarhus University. I'm a really South African, but I've been in Denmark now for four years. I'm currently busy with the postdoc. Yeah. Uh, so, so um, what problem was your study trying to solve, or what motivated your study? We were really interested in African phytogeography, so um, the macro, yeah, the distribution and diversity patterns of um, African plants, and it's a field that hasn't been that well explored, um, mainly because of the paucity of data. Um, so there are a few studies that have looked at species richness patterns of, for example, all, all African plants, but they usually just use a very small subset um, of the um, African species just because there isn't so much data available. Um, so we wanted to um, map a group of African plants um, with high resolution data. And for this reason, we uh, mapped the Diverse distribution and diversity patterns of the African acacias. I should add that the African acacias were recently, um, or a few years ago, divided into two different genera called Vachelia and Senegalia now. And so we mapped the distribution patterns of these and then also the diversity patterns. And then we were interested in what drives the diversity patterns of the African acacias. Most species richness um, studies have found that uh, climatic factors, uh, mainly water and energy, or productivity factors, um, drive species richness patterns at large spatial scales um, of both plants and animals. Um, and so we sort of assumed that acacias would also um, follow this pattern. But when we mapped their diversity uh, patterns and then the drivers, climate actually played a very small role in. Um, predicting their diversity patterns. So we looked into other possible um, uh, factors that could drive um, acacia richness. Um, we included past climatic changes, because those have shown to affect um, other groups of plants and animals in their diversity patterns. And then we also included um, the diversity of large mammalian browsers, um, because mainly because the biology of African acacias is very much influenced by the uh, by, by large mammalian browsers. So one can actually say that their um, biology is characterized by um, adaptations to browsers. For example, they have um, thorns, they have plasticity in, in a number of factors um, in response to browsing. For example, they can increase their thorn spacing or thorn length they increase um, branch spacing when they're browsed. They have chemical defenses, which they induce when they're browsed. And so we included um, browser diversity as a biotic interaction, thinking that maybe it also could predict um, diversity patterns of occasions. Could you briefly explain what you uh, found in your studies, if you had one or two bullet points? We found that African acacia diversity both for both genera is mainly driven by browser diversity. Um, for Vachelia, environmental factors played a small role. Um, for uh, Senegalia, environment played no role in driving diversity patterns. And then past climatic ch changes also didn't affect the diversity patterns of the genus or genera. Could you explain how you determined that uh, browser richness was important in driving um, richness in the, in the two Acacia genera? We used um, a method called partial regression analysis. And with this method, one can attribute the amount of variation um, or explained by different unique factors and then also a combination of factors. So we could determine the amount of variation uniquely ascribed to browser diversity, to climatic factors, and to past climatic changes. And then also the variation where we can't really tell which of the three factors it is. Um, and so we could identify the uni unique contribution of browser diversity um, and all the other factors to acacia diversity. 
So in the in the paper, you proposed a number of uh, possible reasons for uh, correlations between uh, mammalian browser richness and acacia richness. Um, can you walk us through these reasons? We weren't able to explore what um, what exactly the reasons are, but as you said, we proposed some um, theories. One one is a, through an evolutionary arms race. So, for example, the um, acacias evolve thorns to deal with the browsers, and um, the browsers then um, evolve adaptations to be able to feed on the acacia despite the thorns. But because many acacia species are browsed upon by several browsers, and also browsers don't only feed on acacias, but also on other tree species, um, this is probably not a very good mechanism. Um, one other possibility is through reduced fitness. It's very well known that browsing decreases um, the fitness of acacias. For example, acacias will produce fewer pods when browsed. And if they're very heavily browsed, then they actually remain stunted, so they don't even really reach an adult phase and they don't produce pods at all. Um, and this can have one of two consequences. First of all, it decrease, decreases gene flow, <coughs> and this can um, promote um, speciation by genetic drift or specialization to local conditions. Um, it can also reduce competition between um, trees if, if they're very, um, under um, very heavy browsing. And this could uh, result in allopatrically evolved um, species to coexist after secondary dispersal. So you mentioned in the discussion that uh, ecologists often argue that plants drive herbivore diversity, um, whereas you um, seem to argue in the paper for the opposite uh, direction, mechanistic direction. Uh, do, could, you, could you talk about this a little bit? Well, not many people have explored um, to what extent biotic interactions do um, drive uh, large-scale species richness patterns, and the few that have explored um, these um, relationships have found, um, have been found in systems where it's more likely that um, plant diversity drives herbivore diversity. But in this particular case, we don't think it's the case. It's it's that way around. We think it's the other way around, um, for the reason that browsers, as I mentioned, several or browsers will feed on several different acacia species, and one acacia species will be fed upon by different browsers. So we don't think that acacias will actually um, could actually drive the um, the diversity of browsers. Uh, so you, you've talked a lot about sort of richness, but what about um, uh, abundance? Do you think a browser abundance can play a role in driving uh, acacia richness? Yeah, I think that abundance is maybe the missing link in our paper. Of course, if you find um, correlations, um, diversity correlations between two taxes, it's actually difficult to um, ascertain what in that correlation is driving um, why one, the richness of one group will drive the richness of another group. And um, well, I think it is through, through abundance. Um, so I think that increased browser diversity would also correlate with increased browser abundance, and, and this um, could then bring about um, diversification in the caches. But it's something um, that hasn't been explored, um, at least not at large scales. Yeah. Right. I wonder if it's, it could be sort of a saturating or non, or sort of, Non-linear thing because uh, like increased browser abundance would be maybe good for diversity of caches, but then if they're too abundant, wouldn't they hit the populations too hard? And then, well, I think there's um, really two uh, two things here. First of all, I, I think there's a loss of, a, of an evolutionary mechanism. So if if the browsers are lost from the environment, we actually lose the mechanism by which the diversification of the caches takes place. Um, but if, from more local scale data, we also know that there are um, some acacia species that are particularly well adapted to dealing with browsers. So if they are, um, if they are in areas that are very heavily browsed, other species um, might be able to survive in these areas, um, given the climatic conditions and soil conditions. But because of the very heavy browsing um, pressure, they will not be able to um, exist in these species, and then acacias come in or at least these acacia species will come in and um, and occupy the areas. But then, if the browsers are removed from from the areas, 
the acacias lose the, their competitive advantage. Um, so I do think that um, the loss of browsers will actually also result in the disappearance of at least the cater species that are very well adapted to dealing with browsers. So how general do you think the results of your study are? In what cases would you expect the same or different patterns? Well, it depends which field you're talking about. I think um, this paper um, is at least similar in the field of African phytogeography. As I said, it's one of the first papers that's um, mapped um, very accurately the distribution of um, a group of, of plants for the whole continent. Um, but I also, I also think in the macroecological field it's, a, um, it's an important paper showing that biotic interactions are really important at large spatial scales and that these processes that we can see at local scales, um, for example, in this case where browsers have such a strong effect on um, the biology of acacia, is that it's something that can actually scale up to continental scales um, and be reflected in something like um, diversity patterns. Uh, so, so what do you think the consequences are for the, the field of this paper? I hope to. Um, I think now that we've mapped the distribution patterns of the African acacia, there's a lot that can be done with these data. And what I'm particularly interested in looking at, um, I'm not doing it at the moment, but I hope it will still happen in the future, is looking at the distribution and diversity of the traits um, of African acacia tree, trees. They have a, a variety of or a large variety of, of traits, both between species and within species. So, for example, thorn size can, um, in some species, can uh, vary from a few millimeters to over 30 centimeters, or to at least over 20 centimeters, and um, within a species. Um, and I'm very much interested to what extent this is uh, genetic and um, versus uh, induced by local pressures, so, so induced by plas plastic um, plasticity to browsers. Uh, so what, what, what was the most challenging part of the study? Getting hold of the data, definitely. Yeah, I had a lot of uh, locality records and I really wouldn't have been able to do this without input of my co-authors and um, also a lot of herbaria, um, just people who have been gathering this kind of data. Um, yeah, but it took me a long time to get all the data together and also spent a lot of time in Herbaria myself, databasing um, the information and then georeferencing. So putting um, locality um, or, or GPS coordinates to the locality records, um, which took me a very long time and it's quite tedious. But it also allowed me to sort of pour over maps of Africa or Google Maps of Africa and other gazetteers and it was actually quite fascinating. I learned a lot about the African landscape and yeah. It was interesting all the same. <laughs>